Good afternoon and welcome to this session. Reinventing the uh, city to make it more human. My name is Carles Govia. I'm the deputy editor in charge of economy for the Spanish uh, newspaper El Mundo. I come from Madrid. Uh, it's a great privilege to meet for me to be with you here today. I hope this uh, debate will be interesting. The uh, participants today are Claire Rume, who's uh, from Energy Cities. She's a director. Carlo Ratti, who's the director, he, he's an architect. He directs uh, MIT Sensible City Lab, and he's an architect. Marlin Dolvik, general director of SNCF Stations and Connections. We have uh, Winnie Mas. He's an architect, uh, urban planner, and founder of MVRDV, and a president of uh, Altaria. And Taravella, and our coordinator is uh, Etienne Vazmer, economics professor. He will be saying a few words now to uh, give us our introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Inventing the, reinventing the city to make it more human is a huge <laughs> subject, a very broad and ambitious theme. And uh, when I was preparing this session, I was making my notes. I remembered. Uh, an anecdote from one of my ex-students I was working with who was a professor at the Carnegie Mellon. He was a Canadian who came to visit us in Paris. We walked around Paris for a little bit between the Baudelaire and the 16th arrondissement in Paris. And he made a remark from for somebody coming from uh, uh, a city such as Pittsburgh, which was very much affected by the crisis. He said, it's unbelievable today. It's like we, we I feel like in a pocket of uh, wealth, and everybody looks at like each other. Everybody seems very happy and is wearing beautiful clothes. It almost shocked him. It was like a situation of extreme uh, social segregation. He said to me that in the United States, although the inequalities were much worse than in France, they're less visible, less shocking, perhaps. This example uh, enables me to start by saying that European cities, and especially French cities, have changed over the last uh, 15 years in the sense that they have uh, concentrated prosperity, human capital, the people with the most uh, qualifications come into the cities. This is a, a massive underlying trend. At the same time, this has led to a uh, price increase of uh, real estate and a concentration of wealth. This is uh, perhaps a form of resentment uh, against the, the cities in the rest of the country and in the smaller towns who have seen their graduates and uh, qualified people leave. And uh, so this means we have a greater social and economic distance between the two. The priorities for public action fundamentally is to organize uh, the way we live together and uh, the social cohesion of our society and to create stronger bonds between the territories. I'd like to illustrate this with a few figures to uh, launch the discussion, if possible. One of the first questions we can ask is, does this increase in spatial segregation? Is it something that's cultural? If it's only cultural, it would be quite easy because the standards and the cultures change over a period of time, over a generation. We change uh, the models we use. Or, more likely, is it due to economic? and uh, social phenomena, which is things that uh, we are unable to control. And so in that case, the actions we can take on an individual level or in our companies or in the level of the government uh, are more difficult. So I had a look at the proportion of uh, graduates in major cities compared to smaller cities. In France, we have about 30 percent of the population who have uh, higher education diplomas, a little bit less than 30 percent in 2000. And 
2017. 25 years ago, there was half. It was an we had 50% of the uh, graduates, so we have a massification of higher education and an increasing competencies. The question is, where have these uh, young graduates gone? And without any surprise, they've gone to the big cities. Paris now has a population of a, a little more than 2 million inhabitants. 61% of Parisians have a higher education diploma, twice the national average. In the smaller towns, the proportion of graduates is 20 or 22%. Between the two, you have uh, towns with 150 or 200,000 inhabitants, where the figures are higher than in small towns, but lower than in Paris. So there's a kind of uh, divide, educational divide. Uh, the big cities attract talents, the young graduates, with all the difficulties that brings in terms of housing and transport, and also in a positive way in terms of uh, dynamism. You have uh, the more graduates you have in a city, the more you have to gain. The companies have a, a more a greater pool of uh, for to recruit from, and foreigners uh, tend to come to cities uh, which are more economically creative and with more uh, services and more job opportunities. And at the same time, you have this uh, a brain drain in a way from the small towns and the economic distance tends to increase. Just a few figures to illustrate that. 61% of the uh, graduates live in Paris. The 10 uh, largest French cities, 43% uh, of their population is the graduates. Uh, when you look at cities who have uh, less than 100,000 inhabitants, between 100,000 and 200,000, they only had 37% of the population are uh, graduates. Of course, economic fabric isn't only a question of graduates, but it does contribute to the dynamism and the economic uh, vibrancy of uh, a town or city. The idea of universities being a center of attractiveness and attracting executives is an essential one. When you compare the situation with 25 years ago, of course, Paris was already at the uh, was the leading city, but the 10 uh, following cities from Lyon, Bordeaux and Lille, who have accentuated the difference with the other towns. So there's been a kind of polarization of skills in the major, major cities. That's the first thing. And that's a phenomenon which is important for us in our session today for Akatax and others because they are different populations. This leads at the same time to an increase in real estate prices because you have people who have a higher income. And so the, as a result, the uh, property prices have gone up considerably since the 1990s. High incomes are concentrated in the Greater Paris area. An INSEE study recently from Be by Berger and Bonnet, who said if you compare the top 1% of high income, high salaries in France, the best paid, uh, 1%, two thirds are in the Paris region. And one quarter is actually in Paris itself. A quarter is in the Eau de Seine area near Paris. And the other 70% in is in the greater Paris area region. And the remaining third is probably in the other major cities in France. Here we're talking about salaries only. When you look at the wealth and the uh, assets of a household, the disparity is even greater. There aren't any detailed studies about the distribution of wealth in France. When you look at the sources of wealth on a national level, the increase in wealth in, uh, compared to the uh, national average, and there's been a lot of work on this, most of this increase in wealth is uh, property capitalization. So the cities capture this wealth of the French population because they uh, pay a lot of money for their property. When they uh, own this property, they're very rich, and it's the property prices that are behind this accumulation of wealth. These are orders of magnitude which are quite spectacular. In French, we, we, in English, we talk about uh, trillions. So this concentrates most of the wealth in France. So uh, this uh, issue of property biases is a source of difficulty. Young households have to uh, get into debt to be able to buy a property. This accentuates a difference between their generations. Either people are able to inherit a property from their parents. This makes it easier for them to uh, have housing. Also, in a way, it's a good news. It means that the cities, in a way, have become very attractive. What makes what determines the price of property in a major conurbation is the number of people who are prepared to pay that price. 
you can say there's a speculation of property bubble, but the property bubbles exist. Despite the crises that we've been through recently, we don't have any information telling us that property prices are collapsing. On the contrary, property seems to be a refuge. So these, real, uh, these property prices have captured the wealth of the cities. And if we compare the situation of Paris 25 years ago with the property prices were much lower than they are today, this is also because at the time the vehicles were more, created more pollution, the uh, housing was in less good condition, and uh, life wasn't so pleasant as it is now. And that is something that will be the subversive element of our session today. Our speakers are going to talk about the improvements, how to Im transport people better, how to improve the quality of life, how to integrate services uh, and increase social mixing. But all of these improvements, in the end, will probably be capitalized in the property prices. And we have to deal with that. And we have to imagine a mixing solutions so that it's not just the people with the highest revenue who are able to live in the city, so that you have space for nurses, for people working in restaurants and working in the service <coughs> industries where the incomes are lower, so they're able to contribute to this social mixing. Otherwise, uh, the social tensions and discrepancies will become more accentuated. We have a worldwide movement. All of the big cities around the planet are attracting wealth and graduates, but it's a source of uh, social tension. Another important dimension, I can see you are asking me to come to an end of my introduction. One thing that economists are very good at, at explaining they tend to focus on prices, but they also explain very well what we call the price gradients. In other words, the price differences between the center and the suburbs. An economist uh, who did some work, uh, Ricardo, who noticed that the agricultural land was very expensive when it was close to the center because the access to the market was uh, much easier than for land that was much further away from the center. That was 200 years ago. In the 19th and 20th century, transport became the primordial element. We explained the price differences, not the general level of price, which depends on the attractiveness of the uh, city. If you have public transport, which is slow, badly organized, and difficult to gain access to with strikes and uh, uh, antisocial behavior, people are prepared to pay a lot more to get closer to their centers, schools, and services in the city center. If you want to fight against spatial disparities, transport uh, improvement is a vital thing. It's all very well saying you want to reduce the price of transport. The most thing is to be able to transport everybody from one point to another of the city in the most uh, pleasant way possible. With COVID, we've had to rethink this. Do people still want to go use public transport to move uh, from one point to the city of another? Because they'll be very close to each other. We now have the possibility to invest in the future with uh, indebtedness at, a, at a quite low levels. If we were to recommend something, it might be better to invest in infrastructures rather than transferring it to in sector that will have to transform themselves very quickly. So transport is an essential part of the city, the environment also. And I'm sure we will talk about those questions as well. Yes, we'll come back to that. Now I'm going to ask Pierre Clairvomey to say a few words. Clairvomey. Uh, he works on energy cities. It's a question of the strategies and partnerships. And uh, you're talking about not a small change, but a radical transformation in energy policy. Claire, if you could perhaps uh, give us some examples to give us hope in Europe to make uh, cities more human. Thank you for that introduction. I don't know if I can give you hope. Well, what's certainly the case is that all the cities are asking themselves the same questions. These are questions that are universal on a municipal level to ask how we can make cities more human. This also means that within that question, there is the idea that we have succeeded in doing the opposite. We've made cities inhuman. And that means they're no longer suitable for human habitation. This is what the uh, COVID crisis uh, demonstrated. That these cities make it difficult to breathe for people. This is an, uh, an important health issue for anybody who lives in a major city today, wherever it may be in Europe, virtually. 
It's also very difficult to live in an environment which is spatially constricted and uh, noisy, in an environment which can be violent, not necessarily physical violence, but violent because everybody's very stressed, because uh, there's, people don't have enough time, because transport isn't uh, meeting the right needs. What we see today is that there are a lot of changes that need to take place whether it's in the elections or or in the discourse of uh, local mayors and elected representatives, the questions people are asking them today are generally linked to quality of life, but not to the quality of life we were able to define up to now. In other words, access to lots of culture and rich neighborhoods, but instead to have access to the resources necessary to live in the event of a crisis uh, or, uh, or a lack of supply or where supply chains might be reduced. It's a question of reorganizing the city. So I think to make them more human, it's, it's going to be necessary to redesign and rethink the spaces and especially the way people share space. We talk about sharing space a great deal between the cars, pedestrians and uh, bicycles, but it's also sharing space between offices and uh, residential housing. We could uh, imagine a lot of way uh, that um, work, working from home is going to play an important role in the future and also rethinking space in terms of logistics. There's a lot of, I'm sure the other speakers will give more detail about that, but there's lots of transformations of urban logistics and in terms of uh, supply chains of the goods that people need. Everywhere we can see that cities are taking up different positions concerning how they define quality of life and also especially because this uh, corresponds to the climate emergency. This is the framework in which most of the elected representatives today are positioning their action. This means that they have to have a clear heading and a clear vision for the city. The city will only be livable if it's new, uh, neutral in terms of climate, in other words, uh, carbon neutral and climate neutral. This means today that we have to have a clear vision of what we want to do for 2030. Typically, for example, Manchester has decided to give itself a carbon budget. We are seeing a lot of carbon budgets or municipal budgets which would be compatible with the Paris Agreement. That's another way of saying things, and it's a different method. But the carbon budget for Manchester means in concrete terms that they should reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 15% per year up until 2038 when they are supposed to get to uh, carbon neutral according to that calculation. So 15% doesn't mean an improvement as was said in the introduction, it means a reduction. A reduction means completely rethinking transport needs, rethinking our needs for consumption in general and uh, reconciling production with consumption. This isn't something we can say that is something only a few very committed cities are saying, such as Copenhagen or Hamburg. This is uh, something we are seeing more and more, and a lot of cities are t starting to adopt this approach, such as Leuven in Flanders, in Belgium, which also has a plan to become carbon neutral by 2050, to get to less than 50% of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and to do that, they have set out a whole political strategy which is completely different. The radicality is in the methodology and in the posture that uh, municipalities are adopting. They are now going to be very strongly committed to in the economic field, not to govern it as has been the case up to now. This was the role that municipalities have been given up to now, but really to play an active role and to facilitate dialogue between economic stakeholders and make sure that the supply chains are maintained within the territory. And this is uh, more at the level of a neighborhood. This is what Marine Mazuka, who is one of the most uh, popular researchers, uh, talks about in terms of public action. When she talks about uh, looking again at public uh, policy and public action 
in terms looking at it in terms of missions. This is what Leuven has done with 13 missions, and in each of these missions, there are 80 challenges because the challenges are very concrete. But the mission means that we bring all of these stakeholders around the table, and nobody is able to impose their single solution. Another example is Helsinki, where they have uh, a very large uh, private company which supplies its urban heating. All of the heating systems for the city are provided by a single company which uses coal. And this company has always said that it will in eventually decarbonize. But year after year, the municipal council has realized that nothing is changing or things are changing too slowly. And so there's a innovation breakdown. It's not necessarily a big company where there are graduates who can introduce innovation that we need. So they've decided to organize an open competition, a challenge to, with uh, 1 million euros to find innovation to completely decarbonize the heating supply system in Helsinki because they're, they are blocked. They can't move anymore. And so they said, we're going to organize a big worldwide competition and we'll see if we can find a solution uh, uh, as a result of what coming out of the situation up to now. So we can see that our new, the municipalities are playing different roles, new roles, where the municipality says, uh, I can't find a solution. I'm going to force innovation to take place. I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Claire. I'll hand over now to Carlo Ratti. He is an architect and uh, an engineer by uh, education. He works at MIT. He runs the Sensible City Lab. And his work uh, is uh, been uh, uh, implemented in many cities around the world, including the uh, Copenhagen Wheel. It has been praised by Time, Time magazine as the best Milanese inventions. Carlo, welcome. Uh, Buonasera. What can we invent to make cities more human? Yeah, first of all, um, good afternoon, everybody. You know, great pleasure with, to be with you. Um, I actually wanted to start with a very specific condition we are in, and that's the condition we've all been living over the past few months. Now, I did my lockdown in uh, New York and Boston, and then just recently I moved to, to Italy. And in Italy, actually, there's an interesting discussion, and that's why I'm actually connecting today. I decided to connect not from, from my office, but actually from... Uh, uh, a small town in Italy on the seaside in, from, from Portofino. Um, it's uh, in the discussion here is really, well, you know, we've seen that we can, we've proven now we can work anywhere. So, you know, the future is not going to be of big cities. As we just heard, the future is going to be of small cities. Italian says uh, Borghi. Um, well, and so I decided I'll do a little experiment on myself. So a few weeks ago, I moved here. I've settled, I, I camped here, I hold up here. And, uh, and I'm actually connecting uh, from here. So <clears throat> take this as a small experiment. I'm sorry that my, I, I decided today to do it just with the phone so the, the camera is a bit uh, shaky. But uh, I think, you know, this, is, this discussion is, uh, is not only here. You know, you all have heard uh, about what uh, people like Jack Dorsey of Twitter said. And I believe that uh, uh, Peugeot Citroën said something similar just a few weeks ago. No? Twitter said, you know, well, people who don't want to go to the office, they can work remotely forever. So, you know, we don't need offices anymore. And, and you know, uh, the same is happening with, with other companies, also with a bit of crisis, some companies are starting to, to downsize. So I, I'm here for kind of to share with you a kind of couple of thoughts about this. Uh, the first thing is that uh, I think we will still need uh, uh, offices. And uh, the reason we still need offices is that in physical space, we actually have much richer interaction. And I want to tell you about the piece of a short piece of research that uh, we have done. Um, I know there's an article that has either just been published, that I wrote, that has either just been published in Le Monde uh, or is going to be published in the, in the next few days. I, I did it for uh, uh, Project Syndicate and now it's been distributed in, uh, internationally. Uh, and we have shown us some of these initial results of the research we've been doing. And basically what you see is something quite interesting. We have been analyzing how people connect on the MIT campus and how people uh, we're connecting before COVID and after COVID. And what you see is actually that our social networks are becoming poorer. Some of the important ties, the important links in social networks, 
This is what a famous sociologist in the 1970s called Mark Granovetter called weak ties. Well, weak ties are becoming weaker. And that is because physical space is really the space where we meet those people with whom we usually we don't do a Skype call, a Zoom call, and so on. But actually, those people are the people who bring a lot of richness to, to our social networks. So that's uh, um, the interesting thing. And again, it's preliminary results. We are publishing them right now. Um, but I think you know, that is the reason why we still need uh, physical space, the, office, uh, the offices and other spaces where we can actually encounter those people who we meet serendipitously, not the people with whom we schedule a meeting or a Zoom call. Now, uh, that's one part of the story. At the same time, you know, doesn't this mean that we are going to go back to what we've always done? And uh, I don't think that is the same. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the case. Uh, and the reason for that is actually that the flexibility we have enjoyed is something that uh, really, I think, is going to stay with us. And it's going to stay with us. Um, you know, it's uh, about, you know, I believe that many, many of my friends in Paris are now doing two plus three. Uh, here in Italy, it is more flexible. Our offices in New York uh, uh, are still uh, closed, so people work from home. Uh, at MIT, our lab, our team at MIT is actually distributed, uh, uh, most of the people in Cambridge, but also some people around the world. Sorry, there's outside. So, uh, the, there's, a, there's a fly next to me. Uh, so, the, the, the interesting thing um, is, uh, uh, is that that flexibility is something that we come to enjoy and probably want to keep on enjoying. And uh, that means, you know, again, I don't know if this is going to be two plus three, I don't know it's going to be something else in the way we organize our office work, but certainly can be more flexible. Now, I think the consequences of that uh, are going to be quite profound. Uh, from a real estate point of view, we can probably have to rethink a lot of the office space and also to make sure that the time, if it is less that we spend in our offices, becomes more productive in point of view of making us meet other people, of you know, creating those kind of weak links. So that's one part. And the other part, which goes back to the core of we are what we are debating today, is that really that flexibility can be very, very useful in order to make our cities better. And the problem of the city of the 20th century is the problem, a key problem is the problem of peaks. Everything was synchronized. You know, infrastructure usually has enough capacity. But the problem is of peaks that basically we all need to use to get to we In the 20th century, we had to get to the office exactly at the time, all at the same time, and then the infrastructure was saturated. Or we would go on holidays all at the same time, and again, the infrastructure would be saturated. So somehow, you know, the flexibility we have, if we play it right, uh, can become very interesting as an asset to run our cities better. Think about the key thing we've been doing during the COVID, has been flattening the curve. And flattening the curves means really adjusting capacity. In the case, flattening the curve of, uh, of uh, COVID in order to the capacity of the hospital system. But uh, uh, in this case, really, it's about flattening the curve of the city, how we can use it much better. Anyway, I'll finish with this. In our uh, design office, uh, as was mentioned before, I run MIT Sensible City Lab also. Some of the things we are researching, we applied into, uh, into designs with our office, both in New York and in, uh, in Italy. But uh, we're working on a couple of new headquarters that the project started after COVID. And we're really starting to think, how can we organize space in the way that uh, the office of tomorrow is kind of an acceleration? We were seeing that already before, but it's been accelerated probably five or 10 years in the way that flexibility can actually give rise to a new spatial organization in a new beautiful uh, physical form. So that's what I wanted to put on the table for discussion, given that there's this kind of elephant in the room, which is, uh, you know, how are things going to change with what we have seen over the past few months? Grazie, Carlo. Merci de, de vos explications. Que... Thank you, Grazie Carlo, and thank you for your explanations, and thank you for winning over the fly that was bothering you. 
I'm now going to give the floor to Marlene uh, Dolvec. Just put yourself in her position. She was uh, nominated as a general manager of SNCF uh, Stations and Connections on January 29. And on March 15th, uh, uh, the lockdown started. And uh, there are in France 3,000 stations and 10 million passengers. So you had uh, difficult times to start with after a major career in the financial world. I would like to ask you how you feel after this difficult start and how are you going to redesign stations for the new cities we need? Thank you, Carlos. Uh, I'm very happy to take part in this discussion. I am convinced that the city of tomorrow is the station in, of tomorrow. SNCF, uh, Gare Connexion, is a specialist of stations uh, from the architecture, design, to valorization, and to, st to uh, stores. Uh, as you said, we have 3,030 stations, 10 million visitors a day, and 10 million uh, square meter of uh, surface. So a station is a miniature city in a way. I feel like sharing with you, and um, I feel like saying, yes, the um, station, like the city, must be more human, more ecological. And I also have another strong conviction. Stations, li just like cities, should reconcile uses and singularities. And I'll give you examples about that. So cities like, um, stations like cities must be more uh, uh, human. Well, first of all, stations are history. We have beautiful uh, uh, built environment, uh, which uh, we uh, show every year with a lot of cultural events. Uh, in a station, it's in um, a space without discrimination. Uh, stations are places for living, places for shopping, places for services. We have 1,500 stores in our stations, a lot of services, kindergartens, um, co-working spaces. And we are proud to be able to develop these services. Stations are also at the very core of uh, ec ecological transition. So uh, a station is for trains. There's no station without trains. So you go to the station to board a train. And as you know, this is the most uh, decarbonated or decarbonized uh, uh, transportation means, uh, um, especially as compared to cars. So the ambition is to encourage people to uh, take the train to travel by train. We have four major ambitions. First of all, we want to increase the number of bicycle spaces in our uh, stations. We are going to go over to uh, 25,000, uh, 50,000 uh, bicycle spaces uh, by 2025. We are also going to re to resort to, P to PV. And also, we are aiming at zero waste by 2035. We are presently uh, experimenting on that, especially in the station of Strasbourg with the methanization uh, of waste. With this uh, uh, architecture uh, office, uh, we are trying to look at more ecology with biosourcing uh, plants or uh, reuse of materials. So. I do believe that we should aim for the ecology and for this transition. Maybe because I'm a woman or a manager who's very much uh, uh, in favor of execution. And I sometimes feel we should be careful and not forget to reconcile singularities. Let's, let me give you some examples. You can feel that sometimes you could turn off uh, the light of the station or the city so that you consume less. Well, I feel like for a woman who uh, has to go home at 1 a.m., it might lead her to take her car, even though we know that the energy consumed at night is uh, not as strong. So we should think about the impact of our decisions. Uh, in our cities, second example, the stations are wide um, with a lot of air, uh, sometimes cold in the winter. You might think, well, let's not uh, spend uh, or waste energy. But if people don't come to the station because they don't feel comfortable, this will not encourage them to uh, travel by train and they will take the car. 
and we are, we want them to do is to bo uh, to travel by train because this is the most ecological thing. So you shouldn't go too far in um, in your reasoning and uh, deprive people of comfort. Uh, another example: bicycles. You want to encourage the use of bicycles in the intermodality and uh, in the cities, and I um, like uh, for tramways, etc. I say yes, yes. I want to encourage bicycles. So uh, I'm asked, do you want to get rid of cars? I could maybe say yes, but if I think of the young l lady who comes with a, a baby, a two months old baby, two children and luggage, I can't see how she can come to the station by a bicycle. And if you don't make it easy for her to go to the station by car, she will take her uh, car to travel from uh, her starting point to her at point just because she doesn't have access to the station. So what I'm saying is you shouldn't think in a binary manner. You shouldn't uh, think uh, uh, of stations for a young man with no health problems, no family. You have to accept to reconcile the uh, singularities, as I call them, of each and every one. So I do believe in a more human city, a more uh, greener city, a more ecological city more welcoming city, and I did hear Etienne uh, say earlier, a more pleasant city with uh, thanks to transportation. Thank you very much, and thank you for sticking to the time allotted to you. Winnie Maas is an architect and uh, urban planner and uh, landscaper. He's the co-founder of uh, MVRDV, M being for uh, Winnie Maas. Uh, uh, he's a professor of urbanization and architecture uh, of Y Factory. And Winnie, I know you hate to improvise, but we have improvised too much in our cities, haven't we? Thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to share with you. Uh, our thoughts and uh, and to uh, yeah to share with you also a conversation about uh, the future for humans in a city in that way it's a wide subject uh, to uh, to be honest and uh, what I try to do uh, today is basically to make a kind of list of uh, of this width so that we can somehow uh, unravel the this uh, all these aspects of uh, of uh, the human city as such it starts from outside and it goes to inside uh, because we are our cities and our planet is, of course, subject to dramatic changes in climate, uh, as we know, in uh, the depletion of uh, natural uh, uh, resources. Uh, uh, there's a uh, huge income disparities uh, that are creating uh, social tensions, uh, and moving populations demand uh, actions in migration and in transport. Uh, there is a rampant uh, desertification where we need forests, uh, even in our cities, I would say, and, and there's an exponential population growth uh, to be expected, and that requires food, substantially more oxygen, more energy, more water, more products, and less waste uh, in the end. So we need an agenda for this human city now, and, and, and that will form the future of our cities in whatever scale and size, <coughs> and that will shape also our economies that we need uh, for that. Uh, and for me, the city is uh, the main driver of global change. More than half of the population lives in cities, and in the future even more. <coughs> Excuse me. And socio-economic problems and pollution is increasingly taking place. Um, and makes the life in cities difficult. So this also means that any improvement of and to the city are incredibly effective uh, because they touch so many lives and they have instant results. So what kind of cities do we want to have? And I will list up uh, my hopes and my targets, a kind of bucket list, uh, uh, because we need a city that offers equal opportunities to all. We need a city that is social, <coughs> excuse me, and just. Mm. We need a city that's green and, uh, and renewable, and we need a city that is uh, cultured and meaningful. Uh, we need a city that is free and welcoming. We, we need one that's democratic and accessible, and we need one that is uh, exciting and wonderful also. 
And last but not least, we need a city that's intimate, personal, and beautiful. So let's start with number one in that way, the human city as such, which uh, should be human-centered, and uh, we need to listen much more to the voices of those who make the city. Um, we need to ask them about the future and how they envision it. Can our cities be more responsible, more open, more curious? Can they be fearless and experimental? Secondly, we need density. Even if cities are smaller, uh, like Italian cities uh, uh, that um, uh, Carla was referring to, uh, but they need to be walkable. They, they need to be diverse and they need to be sustainable. And uh, the less arable uh, land uh, it occupies in the days of COVID-19, the density might be strange, ID, but dense does not mean overcrowdedness, what I would say. Uh, density reduces still mobility, um, it reduces energy and in the largest, as Carla for instance was saying also, uh, more meeting and more cohabitation and collaboration and therefore economy as such. Thirdly, an equal city, the equal city, and social justice or social injustice actually makes many cities unaffordable uh, for their inhabitants. All cover, uh, all over the world, housing has become a scarce resource, despite the fact that decent housing is a human right. We need a global housing effort to, uh, to offer affordable and uh, at the same time sustainable housing. Fourth, I think uh, bad urban planning that can cause unhappiness and in the end riots. A city that is mixed will not burn. And it's a guarantee for an inclusive effort, an inclusive city. And instead of apartheid between social layers, we need to offer cohabitation to allow interaction and mobility as we discussed. Yes, a diverse and inclusive one. We should be intimate. In the, uh, the bigger the city is, the more we enjoy small moments, urban villages, piazza squares and small gardens. And in the larger metropolis, we all need our own small corners that we know and where we are known. Personal attachment to our cities and to our neighborhoods makes them better. And urban planning helps by making the cities intimate and not, open, uh, not an open space dominated by cars. Six, indeed, the car-free city. Cars are the new smoking. And many people like to use cars, but we all dislike seeing them and we would like to walk next to our busy uh, roads. So more and more cities are discovering that reducing this dominance has a direct influence on their economic performances. In contrast to what we, had, we have been told over the last 70 years, fewer cars means actually more income in urban centers. Seventh, the three-dimensional city. I mean, I know, the three, the denser, intimate and pedestrian cities uh, also deserve three-dimensional qualities. It's not enough to have engaged uh, and lively uh, sidewalks. We need engaged and lively buildings with parks and public functions on higher levels and connect between the buildings on multiple levels. From vertical forests to vertical vill villages, life in the city could be comparable to an Italian mountain village, uh, uh, Carlo, creating the ideal of the city in the city. Eight, we need a green dip. Cities today are heat islands and concrete jungles. What about cities that are real jungles or forests? And instead of covering the cities in concrete, steel, glass and brick, we can also decide to make them green and biodiverse, to have the city become essential in the greening of the planet and reducing temperature and absorbing CO2 and adding oxygen. Ninth is the democratic and free city. Citizens that are treated like adults and able to decide for themselves, not just on how their apartment looks, but also on how their building and their environment and their road work uh, looks, are citizens that are happier and are in control of their own lives. Then we all need to be resilient. Introducing the management of water and, uh, and, and energies we can prepare them for the future uh, and reduce our footprints. And yes, we, 11th, we need to be uh, connected. And I admire the latest uh, technologies and that some of you are stressing at the moment that can Im be embedded into our lives uh, so that we can optimize, flatten the curve, as you say, and, uh, uh, and, avo and to avoid, say, Orwellian scenarios. 12th, I think we 
don't have to be uh, completely generic. Um, not every city needs to have a creative quarter or not every city needs to have a hospital that's specialized in certain kinds of cancer. Specializing will reduce competition among cities and create centers of excellence with a regional function as such. And this requires cities to collaborate and strategize together, moving away from competition and moving towards strategic regional collaboration. I end, of course, with 13, my wonderful city. And beautiful, high quality, uh, uh, wonderful areas are usually the historic parts of town, but they should be everywhere. And then they will be also places that people love and actually more sustainable. We will not break them down. All this together turns the city into a truly smarter city. That's my bucket list. And it regards all levels, all scales, from small to big, say from materials to better facades, to better houses, to better cities and a better world. And it goes from mass produced, produced elements to this kind of wider, a larger scale planning. Yeah, even the smallest element helps. And all these make up to our next human cities. Merci, merci, Winnie. Mais... Well, now we're going to listen to an interview with uh, Alain Terravella, who is president and founder of Alteria, developer of uh, shopping centers and an, a worldwide player in uh, real estate. Thank you, Alain Terravella. What do you think? the city of tomorrow will look like? How do you think uh, prices of uh, real estate are going to change over the medium and long term? First of all, I'd like to say I'm very pleased to be with you uh, in Aix, en Seine, for this session of the uh, Encontre Economique, which is a bit unusual. I know that the overall theme of this meeting is linked to uses of data and uh, data in the city. What I wanted to say, first of all, is that uh, the city of tomorrow has to be a city where people want to live and work and have fun and go shopping and trade. I think data is a means and not an end in itself. In my opinion, how do I see the city of tomorrow? First of all, the first thing we have to take into account is that there has been an inflow of population which will be uh, increasing in the future. And so the metropolization of uh, cities is uh, <coughs> inevitable. We can't prevent that. We can't stop people from moving from a place where they have no work to find somewhere where there is economic equity in the cities. What we have to do is to make sure that this metropolization is happy and inclusive and enables everybody to live happily in these cities. I think the city of tomorrow will be uh, of many different types. There will, it's a utopia to think that it will not be the case. There will continue to be uh, uh, cities where people un don't live happily, where they will be uh, overcrowded and there will be shanty towns in many cities and that will continue to be the place in the 21st century. And then gradually we're going to be able to transform these cities. We have to realize that uh, this capacity to transform cities and have more, more human cities is a luxury that uh, civilizations can afford when they have a high purchasing power and when they can sacrifice a number of elements so that the city is a more pleasant place to live. Today, in our civilizations in Europe, we have cities that work very well. We can st you can always see the problems when you compare them with cities in Africa or Asia. We're in paradise. Our subject here is to for the city to be a happy place. For the city to be happy, we have to change the way we look at it. Throughout the 20th century, there were specializations of one piece of the city to live, one piece of city to do business, another piece of the city to work in. For the cities to be happier, the neighborhoods have to be local neighborhoods where together you can 
different needs. Of course, you need housing. Of course, that's the basis of the city. But you also have to have shops and offices so that everything is all together. And they have, a, and then you have these connected by public transport. So the city of tomorrow is a multiple city. I would say different pieces of cities put together, linked by public transport, but above all, places where we can have social mixing. This is what we do at uh, Alteria as we build pieces of cities. And where data can help us is to help us to get this to work together better. And an important subject is to decide how we can bring everybody into this happy, inclusive and multiple city. What about prices? How are they going to change in the future? You know, prices, we are in a system of a liberal economy. And so a lot of people want to live in cities, but there's not very much land. And people who already live in the cities don't want to have too many neighbors and too many people arriving in the city. And so I would say that tomorrow, unless there's a public intervention by the public authorities, the cities will continue to be more and more expensive because land is more and more rare. And today, the major subject today is that we don't want to have high density cities. People say, not in my back garden. Everything is fine if you do have a development, as long as it's not in my back garden. And people don't want to artificialize uh, the ground and the soil. So there's a problem. The problem is that we need to increase the density of existing city centers. That's going to cost more and more money. I think that overall, there's going to be increasing pressure. There's going to be increasing prices in city centers. Then you can have economic compensation. It depends on the interest rates. And it depends on a number of other factors. But overall, whatever is rare will become more and more expensive. That's perfectly natural. What should the public authorities do to reboost this important sector and to facilitate uh, citizens' access to housing? I would say the public, the, situ the subject of uh, public intervention, as in France and in many other countries, there are two levels of public authority. There are the government, national governments and the local authorities. The national governments should facilitate uh, construction and the purchase of housing through taxation uh, measures and should uh, institute rules so that uh, the housing meets uh, the highest possible environmental standards. The governments have the power to regulate housing in a general sense and to put money into the system so that people who want to buy a house or want to rent a house have the money to do that. That's the first point, but that's not enough. The problem we have today is not the, a problem to do with the government. To, in, or in, I'm talking about France. In France, the government f uh, facilitates uh, purchase and selling, selling of housing. However, in France, we have 36,000 municipalities, so we have 36,000 decision makers who decide what is going to be built in their municipality or not. And today, what we observe increasingly is increasing reluctance by populations to accept newcomers. This is what I was saying earlier. So the uh, mayors of the municipalities are more restricting a new build uh, in, of housing in their municipalities. I'm not saying all of the mayors, but there is a general trend which is to say we want less housing. When you talk about construction of housing, people talk about creating a concrete jungle. When you create housing, you're not creating a concrete jungle. You're giving housing to people who need it. And unfortunately, you can't live in your housing by remote working. When you're living in, in a dwelling, you have to build something. 
you can build it using wood, that will be done increasingly. Whether you build it using concrete, it takes up space in the physical environment next to uh, neighbors. So the most complicated thing is this the role of the national government by an increasing reluctance that we observe by citizens and by their local representatives and the local authorities to accept new constructions, new build in the municipalities is becoming more and more difficult. There are more and more restrictions and probably there are going to be uh, increasing blockages in France this year because we had the municipal elections which uh, were delayed. Perhaps 100 or 150,000 less new dwellings will be built this year because there are administrative blockages. It's not the national government's fault. It's a whole uh, myriad series of blockages on a local level taking place in France. I'll move on now to uh, some questions. We don't have much time, so I'll ask you to be fairly brief. I'm going to start with Claire because you talked earlier about the role of uh, local authorities, uh, municipalities. We just heard Mr. Taravella saying that there are blockages, administrative blockages in the municipalities because they say well, if you're talking about building, you're putting in more concrete and they don't want new neighbors. Can energy transition help to solve that problem? What do you think? What is certainly the case is that up to now, when you use concrete, so you always uh, build in the same spaces. We thought a lot about increasing density and that environmentalism meant increasing the density because this means less need for transport and less uh, footprint uh, on the land. But perhaps this uh, coronavirus, coronavirus crisis is going to lead us to have new ways of thinking about housing, of course. There is a huge need for housing in cities. This is, remains one of the major problems. But, however, we could quite easily imagine today that uh, we could have more interaction and to uh, work more on the level of districts. This is what is being done in Madrid in the previous uh, political uh, term of office where they were working on the urban metabolism by looking at each district little individually. Brussels does this also. They have 19 municipalities in a single city in Brussels. Where, and then they try to think about the city as a, as a bunch of grapes rather than a watermelon. It's not just one center of attractiveness. I think if you think about this densification and this uh, redefinition of needs, maybe we'll be thinking about this differently in other areas which at the moment are post-industrial or other areas which have been abandoned, or other areas which are commercial areas, which are completely inappropriate and do not meet the needs of uh, consumers today. There are plenty, there's plenty of potential today. There are plenty of areas which are not natural areas or housing areas, and uh, this includes office areas in Brussels. So there, they are starting to think very seriously about uh, transferring a lot of the uh, stock of completely empty offices which are being built uh, more and more every day and these offices are going to remain empty, then thinking seriously about converting this into housing. So there's a way of thinking about this differently instead of just thinking about diversification. But housing always re will remain a major problem and it will only be taking place if the cities and uh, the big metropolises, which are very attractive and are uh, dying because of their attractiveness, they're suffocating because of their own attractiveness, whether it's tourism attractiveness or other types of attractiveness, there's going to be new relationship between the cities nearby and the different neighborhoods of these major cities. Carlo Ratti, you heard Claire, who was talking about the problems of uh, where empty office buildings are being built. You were saying that even after the COVID-19 crisis, there will be a need for offices. How, what will these offices be like? For example, the concept of open space. Is this uh, an, anachronism, an anachronism or not? Yeah, 
<clears throat> well, thanks, uh, thanks for asking me. Um, uh, first of all, let me just add something very briefly to what Alan uh, was saying before, and I agree with all his points. I think cities have another thing in addition to that they could do in order to make cities uh, more affordable. So <clears throat> governments can do in order to make cities more affordable. Um, and that is really just, you know, I think somehow the old Latins used to say that there's, the, for the city, use two names. One name was Herb, which was the physical city, and the other name was Civitas, which was the community of citizens. And today there is actually something that's happening in big cities all over the world, is that sometimes you got people who get a free ride, who want to have access to the herb, to the physical city, but they don't want to contribute to the community of citizens. And that applies to both extreme tourism that we've been seeing over the past few years, and it also applies to some of the people who want to have, say, an apartment in Paris and just, you know, use it in the center of Paris or London or New York and just use it, you know, whatever, a few days per year. Well, I think we should make sure that that, that, that is very dangerous for the city. So we should really take action against such behavior because that means, you know, that you're basically giving the herbs, the physical city, to a community which is not contributing to it. So if you go back to this dichotomy of the old Latins, you, you're undermining the very reason of what a city is, which is to provide a physical space for, for the Civitas, for the community. So I think you know, in addition to the points that Alain was mentioning, that certainly cities and governments should take, uh, you know, take to heart and start implement. I think we also need to work along these lines of, you know, making sure that people who want to be in a city contribute to the community. You cannot have a free ride and just be what a Russian oligarch can buy a bunch of apartments and leave them empty in the center of Paris. It doesn't work like that. That should be avoided. Um, going back to your point about offices. Um, so, yes, as I was saying, I think the good news here is that we still need uh, you know, to, to physical space, to create weak links, to exchange ideas, you know, the, the bandwidth we have in physical space is still so much larger than the one that we get also today, like this, you know, think about the beauty. Uh, last year was the first time I participated to the Rencontre in Eggs, in the beauty when, uh, when you're in physical space, the richness that you have, well, we want that. Now, if at the same time, as I was saying, we have more flexibility and we spend less time in the office, we need to start thinking about how to redesign, choreograph office life in a different way so that the time we spend creates more connections, more weak ties. I think it's really about re-choreographing office space. I think, you know, open spaces, as you're saying, were already dead a few years ago. So it's not about off open and closed, I think, again, and also just very soon we will forget about COVID, mm. for sure. I mean, it happened all the times in the past. I'm pretty sure that, you know, I don't know if it is going to be six, 12 or 18 months. We'll keep on getting back packed next to each other. So that's not the point. I think the point is how we can re-choreograph uh, uh, office life. And we, we are doing a few projects about this in, in our design office, you know, how you can really start thinking about, well, let me tell you a few, a few principles. The first one is that clearly if people do three plus two, they cannot have their private office anymore. Otherwise, it would be always empty and also be very depressing. So you certainly move towards hot desking, that people use desk in a, one after the other when needed. That means also having a way to digitally control the space. Also, I think Vinny was mentioning something about, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the power of how technology can help us to, to better use uh, physical space. Um, I think, you know, we will also want to have something that uh, uh, even when the virus is, uh, is gone, that we are more attentive to health and cleanness. And so, again, there's different ways to do it. But most importantly, is about choreographing space in the office. Basically, the point is, uh, you know, if you can work from home forever, like Twitter say, why should you commute to go to the office? Well, you should do it if you bring more richness there. And that richness is what, you know, all of us as designers, as architects, as developers, we can actually bring in order to reinvent, you know, the magic of being together in, a, in an office building. Merci, Carlo. Une question pour Winnie, parce qu'on a beaucoup parlé. Thank you, Carlo. One question for Winnie. We talked about COVID quite a lot already. You said that it's um, 
better to have a dense population while uh, uh, many people feel that a uh, big city, a dense city is a bit dangerous when you have a pathogen like the virus. Uh, why do you say the contrary? Yes, yes. Uh, try to um, to respond to your question. In the in general, um, people as also Carlo expresses, we need uh, each other to see uh, each other and to encourage each other for developing um, and and inspiring uh, each other. So there is a there's a huge need to be together, um, despite maybe that we can have uh, maybe also moments of uh, sharing through the virtual media. Uh, secondly, there is another uh, theme that is uh, uh, still important, that certain densities allow us to keep these spaces open outside uh, for forestry, and especially for uh, and growing populations, uh, we need that, and also to reduce mobility uh, in, in that way. Where the balance will be is uh, exactly the point uh, for now. So I only can uh, show the pictures of a far future that if we don't do that, if we, uh, how, um, mm, how impossible we are uh, making our planet uh, um, when we, uh, for, for to survive basically in it. Merci. Et Marlène. Thank you. We talked a lot about big cities, uh, Marlene. Do you think that small cities should also be more human? And what can your company bring to this? Well, territories are at the very core of the DNA of my company. We have been working, we have a true strategic project on decentralization. We have projects in large cities, but we also work for small cities. We have a project called uh, 1000, uh, 1001 Stations, which enables uh, uh, many collectivities and communities uh, in more than uh, 60,000 square meters over the territory to think about a project that will make the station more human. And in each city, we think about the project uh, with the city hall. We have uh, 50 projects already in uh, some uh, cities like an ice cream parlor in La Bourboule or uh, a medical center in another station. We're working on various aspects of station to restore humanity to the city. Thank you very much. We're not going to have much time for the questions from uh, the audience, uh, even though there's quite a lot. Etienne, please, uh, could you highlight the, more rec the most remarkable ideas you've noted down? Well, first of all, it was fascinating. I felt there was a small tension, not a, a psychological one, but a kind of paradigm difference between those who want to invent new models, even if it means a complete up to overturn of uh, economic and social habits, uh, restore a role for small cities. Uh, um, all this is very interesting. And others feel that uh, social and economic uh, constraints are oh, overwhelming us. Uh, but even though uh, they are skeptical, they feel uh, uh, that uh, you need these cities. I, I come from a small city where I, city, where I studied. I come from Brie, which is one of the three radiant cities of Le Corbusier. Uh, he had good ideas, but after all, they didn't last over the long term. And cities are a place for exchange, for transit, for mobility. And f uh, over the previous centuries, the best thing for a city was to be to have a fair or uh, that or market, so that uh, uh, the people would come from uh, the other uh, areas. So there are uh, two or three uh, global metropolis that have this kind of innovation. And the more you attract people, the more you contribute and develop, uh, the, you, the more you'll have tensions concerning housing and uh, inequalities, inequalities of wealth. 
So I'm not saying you shouldn't be creative in, ide in your ideas, but I'm saying that there are very strong uh, um, movements that are taking place. And then when we talk about short circuit, uh, short uh, routes or short circuits, uh, short chains, uh, this is all very well if you are ready to pay for local products. But when you travel over the world, and all of us here do travel, realize that there's a huge inequality between the people of the world. You have those who can travel where they want, they want, uh, they can uh, live where they want and leave a country if they want to leave corruption behind them. But not everyone. One can have that. So I prefer cities that exchange rather than uh, cities uh, which are creating uh, um, uh, bridges uh, that will lift uh, to uh, keep people outside. Thank you very much for your participation. Bye-bye.